particular regions. And also I will cover a little bit about this uh, injuries in young athlete. And then second session will be moving on to sudden cardiac death and the causes of sudden cardiac death. And then normal ECG finding in athletes and how can we prevent sudden cardiac death. And then we will move on to overview of some few common condition causing sudden cardiac death. So the classification of over injuries, overuse injuries, uh, sporting injuries will be sort of uh, uh, acute injuries and overuse injuries. So the regions will be bone, articular cartilage, joint, ligament, muscles, tendon, bursa, and skin. So if you look at the acute injuries in the bone, mostly fractures and uh, periosteal contusions. And uh, articular cartilage where the osteochondral and osteochondral fractures will be there. And minor osteochondral injuries also will be part of the acute injuries. And uh, ligament injury, ligament uh, uh, acute injuries are sprain, which you normally grade from grade one to grade three. Yeah, if you look at the grade one uh, ligament injuries, uh, uh, will be uh, the yeah the grade one uh, injuries will be uh, just a sprain of the little bit of muscle fiber uh, ligament ligaments are torn, and uh, there is some significant amount of fibers torn in the grade two, and then grade three is complete ligament injury. Likewise, the muscle injuries are. Micro tears involving in the muscle are considered grade one, and grade two injuries are sort of a partial injury to the muscle muscle fibers, and complete muscle uh, uh, muscle disconnection will be a, a grade three uh, injuries. So this will be part of a, um, acute acute injuries, and muscle injuries are also there will be contusion, cramps, and acute compartment syndrome, which we will discuss a little later, and then the tendon injuries are. Usually, uh, the tendon complete or partial tear of the tendon, muscular tendon junctions. Uh, traumatic bursitis, neuropraxia, and uh, skin laceration abrasions will be part of uh, uh, acute injuries. Overuse injuries, which are the sort of most common, or mostly involving in in a sporting setup, where the bone stress, bone strain, and osteitis, periosteitis, apophysitis, these are all part of uh, overuse injuries uh, in 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 bone. Articular cartilage uh, injuries are chondropathies, chondromalacia, osteochondral uh, defects will be uh, articular cartilage overuse injuries. In the joint, there will be sin uh, uh, traumatic synovitis and osteoarthritis will be in overuse injuries. Uh, ligaments, the ligaments can inflame and uh, inflame and also muscles uh, in overuse, there will be compartment, uh, chronic compartment or delayed okay, onset muscle, muscle uh, soreness and uh, facial thickening fibrosis, these are all will be part of uh, um, overuse injuries in muscle. Uh, overuse injuries in tendon are tendinopathies, in bursa, they are bursitis, and nerve entrapments are overuse kind of uh, injuries uh, affecting in the peripheral nerves. nerves. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is the common classification of sport injuries in acute and uh, uh, overuse injuries. So when we see the risk factors for these over these overuse injuries, we can divide them into sort of training errors, malalignment, physiological factors, playing conditions, surfaces, and environmental conditions and equipment. So, so when when we look at the training errors, excessive uh, training volume, and then the sudden increase in the intensity and the type of change, the type of the uh, intensity, and then excessive fatigue without uh, proper recovery and with faulty techniques like you know uh, grip, uh, like racket sports and other other injuries without the proper uh, techniques these all will be predisposed to uh, um, overuse injuries when it comes to the malalignment where the pest plane is where it's a uh, uh, flat food and high arch food rear food wearers tibia vera genu valgum genu vera and there's knockney and the knock knee, femoral neck antiversions, tibial torsion, these are mostly pretty, uh, predisposed to the overuse injuries in lower limb as well as uh, in the lower back, lower back. So physiological factors like lack of flexibility in mus muscle imbalance, muscle weakness and fatigues, these all will contribute to the muscle, uh, the poor uh, biomechanics and which lead to uh, overuse injuries in particular uh, muscle or tendon or, or the structures. When it comes to the playing surface, where the uneven or even uh, whether it's a grass or a, or a concrete cambiate space, where there's where all these will will predispose predispose to uh, commonly in lower lower limb overuse, overuse injuries. Equipments. When it comes to the equipment, it's very important that uh, the appropriate equipment uh, for sports participation, uh, like uh, 
whether if there are damaged inappropriate shoes or worn out shoes basically a shoe with about 400 to 500 kilometer uh, if you run you call it as a worn out shoe so all these things has to be considered you know just for to for the risk factors environmental hot heat and humids are also part of uh, risk factors the other important is that leg length discrepancy lld where uh, which also produce pores to the lower limb and 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 uh, and uh, kinetic chain chain uh, overuse injuries uh, sex size and body composition all and also some part of the genetic components also will predispose to overuse injuries so the common uh, overuse injuries uh, in sports uh, if you look at that uh, the type of over if you look at in the in bone the the, the common is the bone strain bone uh, stress reaction stress fractures osteitis periosteitis Apophysitis. These are the common overuse injuries. We look at the example, stress fracture of the metatarsal and tibia, especially in ballet dancing and uh, sprinting. Lumbar stress fractures where the spondylolysis uh, of pass, uh, getting in gymnastics and uh, cricket fastball, which we will discuss a little later. And then uh, periosteitis where it's a kind of inflammatory uh, process of medial tibial stress syndrome in, in running and dancing and also apophysitis where the it is it, it happened in young athletes we'll discuss this in a young young athletes this is or scoot slaughter where the the patella tendon is attached at the tibial tuberosity where it's a apophysis these are the examples of overuse injuries in bone when it comes to the tendon tendinopathy paratinoitis tenosynovitis tendinosis and tendinitis these are the uh, part of uh overuse injuries actually stand up examples are commonly actually tendinopathy in runners and footballs patella tendinopathies volleyball players we call it jumpers knee the equivalence and you know, uh, in racket sports uh, so these are the common uh, sort of examples of uh, overuse uh, tendon injuries in, and and you know, and then when you come to the joint the joint synovitis labral injuries labral injuries and chondropathies are sort of are in the uh, overuse injuries and examples are like a slap lesion is a lesion where which happen in, occurs in the shoulder which is a superior labrum anteroposterior lesion especially in throwing athletes where the the throwing athlete where the biceps is attached to the superior glenoid glenoid and a re, re, recurrent o, overhead uh, throwing will uh, cause uh, uh, slap injuries injuries and then labral injuries where we commonly we encounter in, uh, in, in hip with functional acetabular impingement where we call, uh, uh, impingement due to the uh, either femoral head or uh, acetabular overcoverage uh, problems which can cause to the labral injuries which we'll discuss in uh, in the hip the ligament when it comes to ligament chronic ligament tears in uh, in, in in elbow with the mcl injuries and muscle chronic compartment syndromes where the anterior lateral and uh, exertional compartment syndromes uh, fascia where uh, fascia delayed onset of muscle soreness ilotibial band syndrome where in in runners in runners where it's present with the lateral uh, knee pain um, and then uh, plantar fasciitis is an overuse injuries of the fascia. When it comes to the bursa, is uh, uh, the common commonly affected overuse bursa is uh, uh, gluteus um, affecting the greater trochanteric pain syndrome, where the pertrochanteric bursitis and also subacromial bursitis, which is causing the impeachment of the shoulder. So that we will discuss a little later and then overuse injuries of the nerve is due to the altered neural uh, mechanical sensitivity of entrapment uh, commonly a lot of entrapment in, in in the hand where it's like this palsy and posterior interosseous nerve in, in elbow and suprascapular nerve in nerve in volleyball players so these are the uh, common type of overuse injuries and the examples now we will move into the regional uh, regional injuries where shoulder injuries the the, if you divide into acute and shoulder uh, acute and overuse injuries dislocation and sprains of the glenomeral chromoclavicular joint and joints are the common one and the muscle injuries in shoulder where you can get strain and uh, rotator cuff strain and tears especially involving in supraspinatus and uh, subscapularis uh, fractures a fracture of the clavicle which is the commonest one of the commonest sport injury and also at some extent uh, scapular and uh, humerus uh, the other acute injury is the uh, uh, glenoid labral injury, which I discussed earlier, where uh, labral injuries where uh, due to the uh, due to the uh, uh, shoulder dislocation or overhead uh, overhead uh, athlete, uh, 
the the glenoid labrum can be damaged and whether if it is a if the labrum depend on the area of the damage we will have different symptoms like bankart is an injury where anterior inferior glenoid labral labrum is injured in the in shoulder dislocation uh, uh, slap is a superior labrum anterior posterior where the injury is due in overhead athletes uh, where anterior posterior of the superior labrum is uh, is is involved at the anterior and posterior the attachment of the biceps tendon of the superior glenoid tubercle the other acute condition is acute instability due to the uh, traumatic uh, shoulder dislocation when it comes to the overuse injuries uh, of the shoulder which is sort of the most common type of the presentation uh, in, in sports medicine clinics where it's a is a, a shoulder impingement the impingement of the shoulder is is uh, the, the the structures which is passing through the subacromial space they are commonly rotator cuff tendon biceps this uh, and and subacromial bursa so these structures are impinged uh, between the subacromia uh, yeah, between the humeral head and, and the acromion so so conditions which uh, there are many conditions which cause this impingement which we discuss later this is one of the common of uh, always injuries and for following a shoulder dislocation there will be instability which is which can be due to uh, posterior anterior or, or a multi depending on the pay, uh, trauma or a traumatic condition Rotator cuff tendinopathy is the uh, commonest one which causes in the impeachment and one of the commonest conditions in, in racket sports and, and, and swimmers, swimmers. And then bicepital tendinitis, where the biceps tendon is going through the bicepital groove and uh, it, it gets uh, recurrent uh, uh, strain and causing the tendinitis. Calcific tendinitis is a chronic condition where that usually has the attachment of the supraspinatus, the attachment of the created tuberosity, the tendon gets calcified and causing pain severe pain the bursite is commonly the sub uh, sub subacromial and subcoracoid bursa which involves in overhead uh, athletes and uh, they present with the uh, impeachment signs addison capsulitis is a uh, also a uh, one of the commonest presentation in our sports medicine clinics usually following post trauma following trauma or sometimes even surgeries it is a kind of it's a, it's a fusion shoulder uh, which is which has uh, multiple spaces, which we'll discuss with later. And nerve entrapment and stress factor of the coracoids also uh, overuse injury, especially in trap gun injuries, uh, shooting injuries, and then brachial flexors, uh, neuropraxia, burners, tinges, which are uh, due to the traction injuries of the upper roots of the brachial flexors are part of the uh, overuse injuries in the, in the shoulder. So, shoulder dislocation. I'll just go through some of the common condition in shoulder. Uh, shoulder the dislocation and instability and a uh, common dislocation you would have seen that it's more 90 percent is an anterior dislocation post dislocation is rare it's commonly happened in uh, epilepsy electrocution and, and electroconvulsive therapies uh, anterior dislocation is in a con uh, contact sports uh, with high incidence of recurrence especially below 20 years what 80 percent chance of recurrence if the shoulder dislocation is below 20 years so and the force is abduction external rotation injury uh, the force into the fall into the abducted and external rotated uh, uh, arm. 80% of, of the time, these injuries are associated with Bankart injury. Bankart injury, as I told earlier, is the antero inferior part of the <coughs> glenoid labrum, where the attachment of the inferior glenoid ligament, ligament, ligament. So they are uh, at the time of the dislocation, they, they when when the humeral head moves out of the out of the glenohumeral joint, it uh, it ruptures the inferior glenohumeral ligament as uh, as well as the part of the <coughs> part of the glenoid labrum, which is causing the bank card injury. And also, there are traumatic uh, <coughs> compression fractures can happen due to recurrent cases or even in some acute cases where posterior superior part of the humeral head get compressed, and this is called hill sex lesion. Hill sex lesion. Now, if you look at that. <coughs> The Bankart injury is bony uh, avulsion of the inferior glenoid ligament and the attachment of the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid labrum. And the diagnosis is by uh, if, if it is in bony Bankart, where the, uh, uh, with the avulsion of the <coughs> glenoid, if the part of the bone also avulsion, that is, we call it bony Bankart, which we do a special view, a West Point view, to look for the bony Bankart, where you can see a bony, bank, uh, bony Bankart injury in this x ray. <coughs> and the hill sex lesion, which I, uh, as I said, is a a compression fracture of the posterior superior superior uh, humeral head due to recurrent uh, recurrent uh, shoulder dislo dislocation <coughs> impeachment can cause a significant uh, compression of the of the uh, humeral head so the deformity is posteriorly 
over the head and diagnosis uh, this is another special view called strike a notch view notch view which we can see the the depth of the uh, of the of the bank injury because large lesions might uh, need to go for a bone graft or you or, or tendon transfer uh, procedures <clears throat> so <clears throat> so the you know, shoulder dislocation it's important to look for the external nerve sensation because external nerve can be compromised so usually we order x-ray ap lateral lateral views and if there is a suspicious we can go for the uh, scapular IV also <laughs> especially if there is a suspicious of anterior posterior dislocations so the the treatment is uh, usually re relocation relocation if recurrent cases can be relocated uh, usually can be re relocated at the field but the first time the uh, dislocation it's always uh, document the <clears throat> neurovascular injuries and and uh, refer the patient uh, to the nearest hospital for re re relocate after relocation uh, of the shoulder <clears throat> strapping should be done to avoid the external rotation and isometric exercises should be commenced early it is it is advised to avoid combined abduction and external rotation for six weeks six weeks but early isometrics and early mobilizations uh, will put them to return to sports in, in a very short short frame of time so recurrent dislocation with instability as i said earlier due to a bank heart lesion or infibular ligament damage will lead will need go to arthroscopic bank heart repair or if the <clears throat> or if the if, if, if the glenoid glenoid loss is more the patient has to go for a latage open latage procedure where it's a bone block procedures depending on the sports and the, and the loss of glenoid the the arthroscopic bank heart or latage surgery can be decided <clears throat> the other uh com uh, commonest one of the commonest uh, uh injury in the shoulder is an acromioclavicular joint sprain it is due to the con in, a, in it's in a, commonly in the context sports where i fall onto the out fall onto the pointed shoulder where you can see the localized pain patient can point uh point out the with, with one finger where is the pain and also the pain will be on a cross arm adduction when I mean, the patient has to adduct the uh, arm uh, towards his uh, cross body uh, the, the the pain will be will be increased <clears throat> so the show the ac joint is uh, ma the main stability is by the capsule and the acromioclavicular ligament where the acromioclavicular ligament is uh, from between the acromion and the, and the clavicle as well as the coraco coracoclavicular ligament where it's coming from the coracoid where it's coming from the coracoid and uh, to the there are two parts of the ligaments which uh, trapezoid and and and, and conoid so these two ligaments also will be involved. So depending on the uh, capsule, acromioclavic ligament, and the uh, CC ligament injuries, divide into a, a, a six uh, group where the type one is just a just a sprain of the stretch of the ligament. Type two injuries are rupture of the acromioclavic ligament by, with intact of the coracoclavic ligament, and type three injuries are uh, uh, rupture of both acromioclavic and coracoclavic ligament with superior superior migration of the uh, of the clavicle type 4 injuries uh, rupture of all ligaments with posteriorly migrating the clavicle and the type 5 injuries are is uh, like uh, rupture of all ligaments and almost uh, subcutaneous the, the clavicle is subcutaneous with the high high superiorly migrated and type 6 injuries are the rupture of all ligament as well as the clavicle is uh, migrated downwards which is more prone to get uh, ne neurovascular injuries injuries so when you come to the treatment of these injuries type 1 to type 3 injuries usually uh, uh, with uh, ice therapy immobilized and with the sling for up to up to uh, sort of three three to six weeks depending on the type and early isometric exercises uh, and and protective brace and taping uh, can help the patient to return to sports early type 4 to type 6 injuries where the complete rupture of the ligaments with uh with posterior uh subcutaneous and, and inferior migrations need surgical intervention uh, intervention for, uh, with appropriate referrals so the uh, when you come to the clavicular fracture clavicular fractures are for uh usually fall onto the outstretched hand the, or in a, in a pointed shoulder uh, there are three types of fractures where the common is the middle third fracture about 80 percent lateral clavicular lateral clavicular fractures are about 15 percent which is which which is which involve in the in, in the ligaments and uh, and sometimes uh unstable and it might need a surgical intervention 
the 80 percent uh, middle third uh, middle third and rarely uh, uh, non union is uh, in, in, in except in distal third as i said so the treatment for these uh, clavicular fractures are sling and figure of eight uh, uh, for a few weeks with early mobilization if you look at that this is the middle third fracture middle third and this is a distal third clavicular fracture which has uh, ligaments of coracoclavicular ligament and acromioclavicular ligament so that the fracture can go through between the ligaments and which make it a uh, uh, sort of uh, vulnerable injuries we may need surgical intervention uh, clavicular fractures are no usually uh, uh, no 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 but uh, there are some conditions which you need uh, in in, in to uh, refer this patient for orthopedic referral, uh, open fractures, neuro fractures with neurovascular compromise, uh, fractures with the tinting of the skin, respiratory compromise, floating shoulder where the fracture involving with the with the with the humerus and scapula, uh, where and 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 uh, and clavicle the, has to be it need open relaxation and general fixation, completely displaced fracture with the comminution, and if there is a foreshortening of the clavicle. Following a fracture, if it's more than two, 20 uh, millimeter, that is also one of the indication for for surgical intervention. So the other other indication for referral is a symptomatic malunion, usually after four months or four months of uh, conservative treatment. If there is a malunion, that also has to be referred for for surgical intervention. <clears throat> shoulder impingement, uh, one of the commonest uh, overuse injuries in the shoulder, uh, as I said earlier. Compression of the rotator cuff between the greater tuberosity and the humor of the humerus and the acromion. So if you look at that, uh, so this is the this is the acromion and this is the uh, humerus uh, greater tuberosity where you have the structures of subacromial bursa, and then you can see the tendon of uh, supraspinatus and biceps by uh, tendon of the bicep, biceps. All these uh, structures can be comprised compromised compromised causing uh, impingement. Usually it's in overhead. Uh, uh, throwers and swimmers uh, with racket sports. Mm. As I said, the structures are rotator cuff, uh, biceps tendon, and subacromial bursa. Uh, usually, the pain aggravates with the overhead activity, and there are impeachment tests uh, like Nears and Hawkins uh, tests will, will be positive with painful arc from 70 to 120 uh, degree abduction. The condition which is associated with the with this uh, shoulder impingement are subacromial. Uh, acromial bone spur or bursitis, AC joint arthrosis, uh, rotator cuff uh, disease, uh, superior labral uh, injuries and biceps tendinopathy. So excessive humeral head elevation, all these things compromise the subacromial space and will eventually lead to uh, shoulder impingement. The treatment uh, uh, is rice therapy where we can also have for tendinopathies can be managed with the glycerol trinitrate patches, GTN patches uh, and uh, steroid or PR platelet rich plasma injection and then follow uh, rotator cuff strengthening as well as uh, correction of the faulty biomechanics which cause the impingement. Adhesive capsulitis uh, formally co is uh, called fusion shoulder. It's a reverse reversible contraction of the shoulder joint using post-traumatic or post-operative. It's a self-limiting condition of about 18 to 24 months. 80 percent in females uh, usually associated, uh, associated with uh, Diabetes, uh, thyroid disorders, uh, MI, following MI, SAMO, and, and even Parkinson. These are the conditions commonly associated with the uh, adhesive capsulitis. The restriction of all movements, external rotation, all movements will be affected. There are three phases of, uh, of adhesive capsulitis during the frame of 18 months, where the, the first is a painful uh, phase, where it's very painful at this stage. The treatment is to it's a pain relief basically so painful during the painful stage uh, it's it, it's very difficult for the athletes or the patients to to do the range of movement exercises so to facilitate that uh, we it is a the management is to to going for an intraarticular going for an uh, steroid injection uh, <clears throat> injection <clears throat> which was one of the question i think we put forward prior to the Assessments. So uh, then, uh, following about four to six months of a painful stage, the patient will they, uh, they will move into a frozen stage where the pain less and the, the, the joint becomes stiff and frozen. Where at this time, the the, the range of movements will be very difficult. So during this period, the main concern is to consider about the uh, the range of movement exercises and active active assisted exercises to 
to, to increase the range of movement. And after a period of a frozen, then it's a thawing phase where gradually the pain, gradually the movement start and, and spontaneous resolution will happen. <clears throat> The treatment, as I said, at the early early phase, steroid injection to expedite the uh, expedite the rehabilitation procedures, physical therapies, and posterior capsular stretch. This is one of the main main mode of treatment. Uh, posterior capsular stretch, which where you can see that uh, there there's, there are different way of uh, posterior capsular where uh, and the sleeper stretchers and 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 also stretching the anterior capsules. So all of these uh, is will. A gentle exercise which can be done at home. So these are the common exercises to for shoulder, for shoulder shoulders. Uh, there are manipulation techniques also. If there are no, if there are no response to response to the the, the conservative management, where in uh, recalcitrant cases, patient uh, can be offered for arthroscopic cap capsulotomy to ease the uh, range of movement. <coughs> so. Then last, uh, nerve entrapment uh, in the shoulder, around the shoulder, uh, syndromes around the shoulder, commonly the supraspinate, suprascapular in the long thoracic nerve. As you all are aware that uh, suprascapular nerve is passing through the suprascapular notch and then it winds around to the spinal glenoid notch. This is suprascapular notch and, and then pass through the uh, spinal glenoid notch. So the nerves at this level, it supplies both supraspinatus and infraspinatus. And uh, at the level of this uh, in, uh, spinal blade notch, the, it's already uh, it has a supply to the uh, supraspinatus, so it's a, I, uh, the supply is more to the infraspinatus. So the injuries can cause uh, uh, suprascapular notch injury entrapment will cause in throwing sports. You will, you will you will find a weakness of both infra spinatus and supraspinatus as in this picture if you look at that the supraspinatus and infraspinatus both uh, wasted this pa uh, this patient with uh, 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 suprascapular no entrapment at this other suprascapular notch notch uh, there are isolated, uh, isolated cases uh, we have seen that uh, where the nerve is entrapped the spinal glenoid notch where especially in vol volleyball players and weightlifters volleyball with the the volleyball players where they are, they are going with the high spike high spike where the nerve gets stretched and uh, the, the stretching of the nerve and as well as the shoulder pathology which can cause uh, the cyst formation and which can affect close to the uh, labrum glenoid and which can also and ganglion and cyst all can cause compression to the spinal glenoid notch which causing the isolated weakness of the infraspinatus the so treatment is non-operative occasionally decompression if occasionally decompression are arthroscopic we have done few cases also uh, the, uh, the, the the other common uh, nerve entrapment is a long thoracic nerve, which is which supplies to the serratus anterior. Uh, commonly due to traction injuries, and also there are some uh, viral infection also uh, can cause uh, neuritis and uh, and this condition. Uh, serratus long thoracic nerve, serratus anterior usually uh, involve involve uh, with the medial wing of the scapula. Due to the uh, unopposed action action of the rhomboids and, and rhomboids and, and, and the trapezius, uh, the treatment is conservative and rarely tendon transfers can be done. If you look at the scapular winging, there is a point to note that scapular winging usually we know that winging of the scapula is a serratus anterior, but scapular winging there are two types of the winging where the scapula can wing medially or the scapula can wing laterally. So the common causes of medial wing of the scapula, as I told earlier, is a long thoracic nerve dysfunction uh, due to supra serratus anterior muscle weakness. The lateral winging of the scapula is unopposed action of the uh, serratus anterior due to the due to the weakness of rhomboids and the trapezius, especially uh, spinal accessory nerve dysfunction. In this case, we, we can all see that uh, the, the drooping of the of the shoulder on that particular side. So it is important to uh, note the winging is whether it's a medial or a, or a lateral winging. Uh, now we'll move on to the uh, common uh, elbow injuries in sports. So acute uh, injuries, the commonest dislocation is the uh, uh, elbow dislocation. The posterior is the most common one, and then medial collateral ligament, medial collateral ligament injuries in of the elbow, fractures, supracondylar radial head montegia fractures also uh, are common around the elbow region. Uh, then tendon injuries, uh, uh, tendon injuries like biceps and uh, tricep ruptures are common acute injuries in in, in around. Uh, uh, elbow. When you come to the overuse injuries, ex uh, tennis elbow, we all know that excess tendinopathy, tennis elbow, and then 
other lateral uh, elbow pain is supposed to be in process nerve entrapment and medial medial side of the elbow injury is a flexor pronator tendon of the golfer's elbow or chronic mcl sprain in in uh, in sports like uh, in, in in baseballs um, also the ulnar nerve compression due to, to excessive uh, uh, vulgar stress cubital tunnel syndrome and then triceps tendinopathy well, uh, the other condition is uh, like throwing and especially juggling and like sports where due to the throwing biomechanics due, due in excessive hyperextension uh, in the in the late acceleration fa uh, phase of the uh, throwing can cause this uh, vulgus extension overload syndrome where there there, there will be a components of uh, medial contra ligament injury as well as the radio radio capital joint joint compression and uh, postromedial uh, olecranon uh, olecranon surface or pathologies so uh, we'll move on to the extensive tendinopathy where it's a less lateral epicondyle it is a tennis elbow one of the most common overuse injury in in our practice i think everybody would have definitely overcome it is it is a it is commonly the record sports or repetitive the, the, the main mechanism is a repetitive uh, extension of the wrist whereas uh, the, whereas uh, the, the, the entrapment the entrapment of the of the of the the pin is most commonly due to repetitive supination and, and pronation of the so it's important that the, the particular sport is if the particular sport is more onto the uh, uh repetitive extent extension of the wrist uh, they are more prone to get over uh, extensive tendinopathy so mm. the common uh, tendon is a uh, extensive copy radialis brevis uh, brevis tendon and <clears throat> during the regeneration phase the the faulty uh, mechanics and the proliferative equipment like uh, uh, poor grip and and the poor string tension in the in, in the rackets all of this predisposed to the uh, <clears throat> predisposed to this uh, uh, tennis elbow so if you, uh, examination it is important know that examination the the tenderness and the pain is anterior or one to two centimeters distal to the lateral epicondylitis. It is important because whereas the, the, so the posterior entrosis nerve entrapment, the pin entrapment, the, it will be about uh, about four to, four to five finger breaths, uh, down the lateral epicondyle. So it's important to know that the, the, the pain in the tender, tender point uh, and also the radiating pain along with, uh, into the extensors with, with, with loading and uh, um, usually the, uh, the uh, ultrasound uh, may indi may indicate that uh, if, there, if there is a chronic pain uh, to exclude a tear or or any calcification or any fluids around the around the, around the tendon uh, <clears throat> pain with uh, wrist extension and, and 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 the painful grip is the commonest finding when the patient when you ask the patient to grip, it will be painful. So the management basically the, it's a relative rest and relative rest and identify the faulty uh, biomechanical errors, errors, and then correct the correct the pro proper techniques uh, and uh, analgesics and uh, uh, therapeutic modalities with uh, modalities are useful, especially the extracorporeal shockwave therapy is very much useful for certain conditions. So uh, the Lateral epicondylitis is one of another condition. Uh, then uh, bracing, brace, counterforce brace, uh, and 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 taping with with uh, there are some evidence that platelet-rich plasma injections have uh, expedited the recovery. Mineral therapies and nitric oxide donor therapies are, have been uh, widely used, and most of the time the patient recover with the symptoms. But if if the patient uh, if the condition is recurrent and and the symptoms are not not resolving and the ultrasound findings are suggestive of a, of a significant uh, a pathology uh, there is a possibility for to go for a surgery after a, a 18 months of treatment if you look at the if you look at the treatment uh, of, of uh, for tennis elbow the main uh, the first is that we have to uh, in, uh, strengthen the wrist extensors where you can see the resistant Elbow extension is, is is one of the one of the, one, one of, uh, the free weights is one of the main, and also you can use the <clears throat> you can use the threads and the bands to do the extensor exercises. Stretching, it is important to stretch the extensor muscle. This is the typical way of stretching the extensor carpi radialis or extensor 
tendons. Count of force brace, where when the patient returns to sport or even at activities, you can apply the count of force uh, brace about a few inches below the lateral epicondyle to unload the uh, ERCB tendon, where thereby uh, promote the healing. Healing, and there are uh, there are special uh, taping te techniques and triangular uh, taping te techniques can be used to minimize the injury. And as I said, uh, this is a nitric oxide donor patches, which is uh, this is promising uh, for tendinopathy, especially in the elbow and the supraspinal tendons in the treatment. The other condition uh, which always uh, we come across like uh, in, in the settings of uh, uh, tennis elbow is a posterior entrosis nerve entrapment, which is a radial tunnel syndrome, where it, this is also a, a pain in the lateral elbow, but the, but the pain in the tendon is more distally compared to the uh, tennis elbow. So because the pins uh, begin at the level of the radiocapital uh, uh, joint, and it's a pure motor to the extensor carpal radialis brevis supinatus and extensors, extensors and, and it passed through the uh, supinatus muscle. If you look at the if you look at the if you look at the, the this is supraspinatus muscle and it, it comes through the muscle and it exit the, the exit so there is more vulnerable uh, with, with movements of uh, repetitive forearm pronation supination where where the nerve can uh, get entrapped entrapped so as i said the maximal tenderness are three to four inches below the lateral epicondyle and there could be some paresthesia of lateral uh, in the hand or lateral forearm Severe pain with resisted uh, supination. So the the lateral the tennis elbow is a severe pain with resisted wrist, wrist extension, whereas uh, pin entrapment the severe pain is a uh, resisted supination in a, in, a, in a flexed elbow. So so the compressions are there are many many reasons for compression. One is due to repetitive over over uh, repetitive uh, boom, uh, supination and pronation. As well as there are some anatomical reasons all, uh, also have been contributed uh, with the uh, fibrous band uh, anterior to the uh, humor uh, to the fibula uh, to the uh, radial head and also recurrent radial radial the recurrent radial vessel which can cause the compression of the of the <coughs> of the nerve as well as uh, arcade of force where the, the tunnel origin of the supraspinatus which also can co cause the compression and also the margin of the extensor carpal radialis uh, ten, tendon also can compress the nerve. These conditions can predispose to uh, uh, pin, uh, pin entrapment. Investigations, uh, clinical, find, clinical findings, as well as uh, nerve conduction studies. Uh, the treatment usually self-tills of tissue therapy, neural tissue mobilizations usually resolve the patient with correction of biomechanical errors. Some cases might need, need sur surgical release. The other condition is a uh, golfer's elbow, which is a flexor or a pronative tendinopathy, usually about 30 to 50, uh, 50 years old. This is due to repetitive microtrauma of the common flexor tendons, commonly the pronative teres. The, the main sport is golf. If, if you look at that, the golf swing uh, is a golf swing, where the pain is in the inner aspect of the elbow. Even the tennis with the fo uh, forehead or top spin, also similar mechanism can cause this uh this condition so the pathology as i said common flexor and uh due to this uh close association with the ulnar nerve association with ulnar nerve the nerve can be irritated in this condition so the tenderness uh usually at or below the medial epicondyle the pain with resistant flexion the, so the, the lateral epicondylitis is the, the tennis elbow is pain with the resisted extension whereas uh, golfer's elbow, the pain will be on a resisted uh, flexion with the forearm and on a pronation. Treatment, usually all the treatment modalities are similar to lateral epicondylitis and most importantly the correction of the uh, faulty techniques. Commonest, um, the elbow dislocation is the one of the most commonest, commonest traumatic injury, usually fall onto the outstretched hand with the elbow in a hyperextension position. Uh, severe, uh, severe twist also injuries in a flex position also can cause this. Elbow injuries can be associated with the fracture of the medial epicondyle, radial head, coronoid process or olecranon. So it's very important to look carefully look for these the structures. structures. Uh, the commonest is the posterior dislocation. Um, it is important to exclude the neurovascular injuries with the uh, elbow dislocation, posterior dislocation. 
when you come to the treatment, it's an emergency. It's an emergency. Uh, the field site reductions are not recommended uh, in, in due to their close uh, association with the neurovascular injuries. Injuries. <coughs> so the treatment is ice compression, sling, and immediate referral to the to the appropriate uh, facility. Moving on to the wrist injuries. So when it comes to the wrist pain, it, it, it is it's a very complicated structure where you have a lot of st many structures in a, in, a, in a very small area. So it, it is important to divide whether the the the, the wrist pain is a dorsal pain or, or a volar wrist pain. Because uh, the dorsal pain again you will have a radial side, central and ulnar side. When it comes to the volar wrist pain again, it's, it comes to the radial, central and ulnar side. So if if you locate that. So dorsal or a wall, then we can uh, we can identify which structure is more mostly involved. So if it's a dorsal radial radial site, the most common is an extensor carpal radialis tendon, tenosynovitis, uh, uh, which is usually uh, which can be in, in, in golf and repetitive uh, abduction in abduction. The other condition is a decoyant tenosynovitis, where the abductor policy is longest and extensor policy brevis involved in a repetitive abduction of the wrist wrist, and uh, the other. Uh, dorsal uh, radial conditions is scaphoid fracture and intersection syndrome. Intersection syndrome is a is a condition where it's a proximal uh, irritation of the compartments of the first and second compartment. That is the the tendons of of abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, and extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, which cross uh, about five six inches pro proximal to the wrist. And at that point, the nerve get irritated. Especially, it's uh, it's in a row. Was that's what they call the Osman wrist. We will uh, go through that a little later. And the other condition where is a gymnast wrist. So all uh, all these conditions are affecting on the radial side. Uh, uh, radial side. So when you come to the dorsal and central, the common one is a, a ganglion. We all know about that. And then the pin pin entrapment nerve. As we discussed earlier, there will be sensation. Uh, sen some sensory uh, yeah, at hand, the mostly it is on the dorsal aspect of the uh, dorsal central aspect. The other condition is a, a scaphoid lunate, where there is a ligament between scaphoid and the lunate. That ligament can go into a sprain, and a scaph scaphoid lunate dissociation is also one of the uh, reason for the dorsal wrist uh, pain. And and there are rare condition where of keen box This is where the <coughs> vascular necrosis of the lunate, which also can present with the uh, dorsal wrist pain. Ulnar side pains commonly uh, of the dorsal ulnar pains are uh, extensor carpal ulnar stenosynovitis and the triangular fibrocartilage complex. We will uh, discuss it later. And the other category is a volar wrist pain. Uh, volar wrist pain on the radial side, it's a metacarp uh, metacarpal osteoarthritis. Is, that is a that is the condition which mostly involving and flexor carpal radialis tendinopathy. So these are the conditions which can pose wrist pain on the volar aspect. Uh, uh, radial uh, side pain on the wall aspect and uh, centrally we know that it's mostly on a carpal tunnel syndrome and the ulnar side of the uh, wall aspect the, the, it could be due to CAT1 uh, involvement of the thoracic outlet syndrome or hook of the amid fractures uh, cyclist palsy cyclist palsy <coughs> uh, cyclist palsy where the, the ulnar nerve entrap at the guyon's canal guyon's canal <coughs> um, and then flexor carpi ulnaris uh, tendopathy. These are the, so this is an overview of the wrist wrist pain in sports, where we divide into dorsal and the waller, and then uh, each com will go into a radial, central, and the ulna compartment. <coughs> now, uh, one of the commonest injury in in the wrist is a scaphoid fracture. So most common carpal bone fracture. For uh, this is the one of the one of the injury uh, happened in fall onto the outstretched hand force injuries. Usually, there is a snuff box tenderness with swelling. There is a loss of grip and pain with axial compression of the thumb. These are the common cardinal findings of the of of, of, of uh, scaphoid fracture, especially fall onto the outstretched hand. If uh, X-ray, there is a uh, special scaphoid views are there. If there are suspicious, patient can go into a scaphoid cast and and the X-rays can be repeated in, in a week or two. But uh, CT scan uh, for a shuttle fracture is an, uh, is, is an ideal investigation in, in acute setup. The treatment, when you come to the treatment, uh, it, it should be immobilized for eight weeks in a scaphoid cast. Uh, if you look at the scaphoid cast, where you can see the 
uh, this is a uh, scaphoid cast where uh, the thumb is movements of the thumbs are are preserved and this uh, eight weeks cast is is compulsory and if there is an if incomplete union i mean after uh, after eight weeks you remove the cast and examine the patient if there is an evidence of clinical uh, tenderness or incomplete union by x-ray further four weeks of, uh, of cast is necessary there are conditions which need uh, open reduction internal fixation like uh, herbert screws which we can see here we are usually if the fracture is unstable after the after the after the manipulation after the mobilization or angulation if the angulation of the scaphoid fracture is more than 20 degree or if the if, the, if there is a displacement with the diastasis between the fracture more than two millimeter these conditions go into uh, avascular necrosis and therefore they need a uh, uh, open reduction internal fixation <clears throat> the complications are delayed union or or avascular necrosis so the other condition is a radial epicel injury which is a injury commonly in, in a skeletally immature athletes which is we call it a gymnast wrist where if you put, you can see that it's a <clears throat> distal radial epiphysis is uh, is widened it's widened sclerosed sclerosed so, so this is commonly present with the dorsal wrist pain which we discussed earlier so compression of shear force in the distal uh, radial epiphysis due to the shear, shear forces uh, which lead into a sclerosis widening and, uh, of the physis uh, in some cases where it, it can go into a salter harris five type fracture which we'll discuss later uh, if there's an a narrowing we, uh, growth growth plate can be compromised so recovery it takes uh, several months so it's important to brace brace in it to reduce the hypex because the injury is mostly the gymnast uh, the most commonest is the hyperextension of the wrist this is the one causing the compression of the distal uh, epiphysis so we have to brace to minimize the hyperextension of the wrist the other common condition in, in practice is the decubitus stenosynovitis uh, where the synovium of the first dorsal compartment, that is abductor pollicis longus, uh, pollicis brevis, and uh, pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons, uh, tendons involved the, at the level of the radial styloid, where the, this is the this is the tendon of co first compartment of the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis uh, at the, at that at the uh, radial styloid. Yeah. So this uh, inflammation around this region caused the decubitus stenosynovitis due to hyper uh, abduction. So repetitive hyper abduction, like your uh, uh, movements uh, in in golf, like in, in racket sports with the hyper abduction, can uh, cause this injury. Finkelstein test is a specific test uh, which is positive for this condition, where you flex the thumb and then forcibly uh, ulna deviate the uh, the wrist, which causes severe pain because of the compression at the at the uh, radial styloid styloid management is splinting to minimize the abduction uh, repetitive abduction uh, and then wider golf grips uh, golf grip is important electrotherapic modalities uh, and steroid injection will uh, release the condition if there are no response and uh, recurrence with after steroid injection a surgical release of the sheath has to be done uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, high uh, hyper abduction a particular brace for decubitus stenosynovitis, which is widely available. The other condition which I discussed earlier, the intersection syndrome, uh, where the Osman wrist, commonly in, in rovers, in rovers, it is a tendinitis between the first and second do dorsal compartment, which I said the first compartments are abductor policies, longest extensor policy brevis, which involves the decubitus, and then the, the second compartment is. Uh, uh, extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. So between these, these there, there, there is a compression. This is the site of the irritation. So the, usually the tendon is proximal from, uh, from the wrist tenderness. So the friction site of the crossing, swelling and crepitus will be there. Uh, the treatment is a steroid injection and surgical uh, decompression with uh, correction of the faulty techniques. The other uh, injury in, in, in the ulna side, side is a TFCC injuries, uh, which is rare, but uh, but we commonly see in, uh, as a traumatic form form form. Triangular fibrocartilage is a structure where we can see that the structures 
between the ulna and the carpus. Ulna and the carpus, where it has uh, interca uh, uh, ligaments of uh, there, there's an articular disc and uh, disc and and uh, distal radio ulna ligament, dorsal and the volar uh, ligament, and also extensor carpi <coughs> uh, uh, ulnaris, ulnaris. The disc and there are also it carpal ligaments are also part of this uh, TFCC. Uh, <coughs> common injuries are in racket sports and and stick sports, where it's like in the form of acute injury or even overuse conditions. So repetitive compression of in gymnast and weightlifters can cause this condition to a uh, chronic uh, overuse uh, TFCC injuries. So it's ulnar side pain worse with weight weight bearing or a grip. So if you ask the patient to to press, uh, we call it a press test. We ask the patient to press the uh, wrist, uh, the palm is with uh, the palm is on, on an extensor position, the, there will be a significant pain. And tenderness uh, at the base of the ulna stavulite, which is called a phobia sign. These are the common uh, features of the TFC injury. Uh, investigation of choices in MRI and also arthroscopy. These are the gold standard for diagnosis of a triangular fibrocartilage uh, complex injuries. Treatment is an immobilization with the splint. So splint. So these are specific splint for TFCC uh, available. And then the uh, so the important is that immobilized immobilization can last from four weeks to six weeks, uh, depending on the type of the injury. And then gradually uh, strengthen the grip. And then the the, the definite treatment is in surg surgical repair. Moving on to hand and finger injuries, I will quickly uh, overview the hand and finger injur uh, injuries um the 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 if you look at the injuries uh flexed digitorum profundus avulsion which we call it a jersey finger where avulsion of the where avulsion of the uh, flexed digitorum profundus profundus the treatment especially in uh, rugby football courts treatment is an early surgery or if it is late so reconstruction we will discuss a little bit about that condition later flexor tendon pulley injuries we have we call it the climbers fingers it's a rock climbers and uh, mountaineers uh, taping and surgical reconstruction is the treatment management sagittal band rupture this is a bo boxer's knuckle sagittal band uh, rupture at the carp uh, carpal metacarpal joint uh, metacarpophalangeal joint uh, joint the sagittal band can rupture used commonly at second and third fingers uh, which need a surgical support in boxing and surgical reconstruction. Ulna digital nerve neuroma is a bowler's neuroma where the, the, the 10 pin bowling people will get this uh, repetitive movement, can go into uh, traction and neuroma of the uh, ulna digital nerve. The other conditions is skier's thumb, where the ulna collateral ligament uh, rupture happen at the metacarpal phalangeal of the thumb. Uh, we call it a skier's thumb. It commonly happen in skier, skiing and football, splint and surgery. Surgery, especially if there is some uh, sternal lesion where the, 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 the torn ligament is uh, stuck in aponeurosis. Uh, the other condition is a boxer's hand where the carpal metacarpal subluxation and uh, hook of the hamid fracture. Uh, these conditions are common conditions which are uh, related to the uh, hand and uh, hand conditions. Now, when we uh, metacarpal fracture, if you look at the metacarpal fracture, the base of the first metacarpal, usually fall onto the abducted thumb or in a punch in, in a sports like uh, in boxing, where you can see the fracture of the base. This is called a Bennett fracture, is a partial intraarticular fracture. Whereas you get a severe form of the fracture where the complete intraarticular fracture, this is called Ronaldo, fra Ronaldo fracture. Uh, these fractures need, uh, need uh, uh, ORIF. If Bennett fractures uh, can go into a close reduction or a percutaneous wire fixation with the cast immobilization, extra articular fractures can be managed with the sort uh, thumb spike up. So these are common uh, sport injuries which come into the orthopedic practice. So we, it's better to be aware of this uh, special uh, fracture, the metacarpal first metacarpal base. The other common condition which in, in, in fingers is the proximal uh, PIP joint, 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 joint dislocation, proximal uh, interphalangeal joint dislocation. The commonest, it has a volar and the dorsal. Dorsal is the most common with the hyperextension. When the finger is a hyperextension with the longitudinal stress. It's like, like uh, commonly, you know, it, it can happen in uh, sports like uh, baseball, baseball, and 
and ball catching uh, sports where the 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 axial uh, the longitudinal stress uh, happened to the hyperabducted uh, of hyperabducted and the wall of plate injuries is is very much important to to exclude here because uh, all all has to be extracted radiograph should be proceed uh, in case of uh, pip joint injuries because it's it's associated with the wall of plate injuries which need surgery otherwise if the if if the wall of plate is not corrected corrected and this can go into a, a botany botany deformity <coughs> where you can see the deformity the the rupture of the central slip rupture of the central slip can go into a uh, hyperextension of the distal phalanx with the flexion of the pip joint leading to a botany deformity which need a surgical correction uh, botany deformities can also be managed with the full extension or a splint like a barrel splint splint for a pip joint but surgery is the appropriate uh, treatment for this condition the other common condition conditions associated in the in the fingers are mallet fingers and jersey fingers so mallet finger is a it's a flexor flexion deformity of the dip joint if you look at the dip joint there is a flexion deformity deformity due to the avulsion of the avulsion of the extensor extensor digitorum tendon uh, at the attachment of the distal phalanx so the 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 tendon is rupture especially the baseball catchers and cricket ball, basketball ball the management is this is called a stack splint where the splint has to be applied for 8 weeks if there are soft tissue injuries that means the, the bone if, if there is no bony avulsion the bone could be avulsed from here if the bone is not avulsed it can be managed for eight weeks if, they, if there are bony mallet injury if the, if the bone is avulsed the immobilization is a little bit shorter for six weeks usually return to place about about eight to ten weeks ten weeks of this condition <laughs> jersey finger is a condition where it's a common happen in the, in the ring finger it's a forceful extension extension forceful extension of the distal flanks while uh, in an active uh, while actively flexing when uh, when an athlete is actively flexing there is, there is a forcible extension force applied the flexor digital profundus tendon will rupture which is lead, leading to inability to actively flex the uh, distal phalanx so it is important to exclude uh, uh, to take a radiograph to exclude the avulsion fractures because there are multiple grading because the the avulse fragments can come into the palm or it can or it can be avulse uh, retracted to the palm or it can be retracted to the to the uh carpo, uh, joint joint or pip joint depending on that the treatment plan is and the surgery sur surgery surgeries uh, whether early or a two stage reconstruction can be done uh, moving on to the uh, lower back pain now we have completed the upper uh, overview of this uh, upper uh, limb injuries and now we'll uh, quickly go uh, going to the lower back pain it is important to note that lower back pain there are three categories pain with specific pathology it's about five to ten percent they are fractures stress fractures spondylolysis that is a pass intraarticular fracture or disc prolapse uh, spondylolysis where the, the 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 slippage of the uh, of lumbar vertebra from one another and first joint arthrosis these are the condition with the specific pathology 90 percent of the condition of low back pain are non-specific because there is no pathological diagnosis it is always important to exclude red flex and, and the serious pathology which is about one to two percent like malignancy systemic inflammatory diseases and infections when, when an athlete uh, come with the with the low back pain <clears throat> commonest presentation of the low back pain in in in, in our sport medicine clinics is the uh, lumbar spondylolysis or, or the stress fracture of the pars interarticularis. As you all know, the pars interarticularis is a is a structure of the pars interarticularis which you can see here between the superior articular process and the inferior articular process. Super, this is superior articular process and this is the inferior articular process between this structure called pars in pars, which is which is uh, more stress in sports which using the, which is mostly involved in repetitive hyperextension rotation and lateral flexion so the any sports which involving the re repetitive hyper extension rotation and lateral flexion are more prone to damage the past uh, structure and the sports like tennis cricket fast bowling um, ring boards gymnasts soccer players and volleyball all these uh, have these recurrent uh, repetitive movements are more vulnerable to get this injury uh, 
<clears throat> the commonest clinical findings are they have pain with the extension. Uh, single leg extension is one of the stroke tests, one of the, one, one of the tests we perform. This is very much painful. You can see the test, very much painful in this condition. <clears throat> so if, if you look at the injury, it, it has a three terminologies. Mainly, it could be an active bone lesion where there, is, there could be a bone, presponderotic bone stress or a stress reaction or a hairline stress fracture. This is one of the active bone lesion or else the injury can be a non-united fracture with the with the bone defect with the bone defect these are the terminology of this condition so the investigations are mainly targeted onto the uh, onto the uh, lumbar spine uh, uh, oblique views where you can see the in this oblique view of the lumbar spine where uh, you can see the pass in the form of a scotty dog where it's the neck of the dog is the area of the between the superior and the inferior articular process so this is the area we are concentrate on, on, on an oblique view to see, look for sclerosis or a hairline fracture even the cone beam uh, views will be much more uh, beneficial than, than this the other investigation of choice is respect uh, ct single photon uh, ms ct uh, this is also uh, one of the treatment model modalities but the, now the the, the investigation has been more changed into a more towards an MRI of a lumbar spine because it can detect the very early presponderotic uh, lesions. So, especially in, 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 in athletes who present in a very early stage, the X-rays uh, and CT will be will be negative. Whereas we can uh, detect the bone edema like this, they, like the edema like this condition, and uh, start the treatment uh, as early. Uh, yeah, chronic non non united fractures are better seen in, in CT. Where you can see the uh, the defect and the irregular margin of the uh, of the posterior element between the of the pass. The treatment treatment for this condition is basically uh, in, in a multiple phase, and then the return to play uh, can take up to sort of three to six months. In complex cases, it can go up to twelve months. Twelve months. So the the treatment is mainly targeting on the healing of the fracture in the first eight weeks, where uh, it's a rest with the brace. It's, rest with the proper brace and then following that uh, healing uh, fracture healing phase the patient can go into a, a protective uh, reloading phase where you can go into a gradual strengthening of the uh, back muscles uh, especially the coast core, core muscles and for the the first eight weeks and then another, another eight weeks and after 16 weeks the patient can go into a full function and full functional movements and then return to sport so it's about three to six months of a uh, return to time but early direction will definitely heal the patient and, and with very good outcomes <clears throat> bilateral uh, spondylolysis is a condition where bilateral past defects usually develop in early childhood where, uh, with the slippage of the uh, vertebra from one another you can see the slippage of l5 on s1 s1 is a familial predisposition stress fractures are rarely so the bilateral stress fractures are rarely so most of the time it's a, it happened in the childhood it it, uh, it is a grading it's a grading of uh, the grading uh, is based on the slippage percentage now if the 25 percent slips a grade one person is a grade two grade three is about uh, 75 percent uh, slippage and and uh, 100 percent is about grade four so based on this grading the treatment treatment varies most of the time conservative management is very much successful uh, grade one and grade two injuries are uh, usually non, non, non surgical and uh, grade three four initially conservative management for six months usually uh, with the promising results but if there are no uh, promising results in six months grade three and four injuries surgical fixation with the fusion can be attempted without the quick referral <coughs> so sports uh, conditions uh, around the hip now moving on to the hip condition the hip conditions are also one of the one of the commonest uh, in sports where we can have the divide into anterior lateral and the posterior hip pain so the the commonest uh, condition with the anterior hip pain is the labral injuries and femoral labial impingement and uh, we will uh, discuss about that and then stress fracture of the neck of femur which we should not miss and synovitis and osteoarthritis ligamentum teres tear which all present as a as an entity hip pain and also a groin related pain which we will uh, discuss about in uh, under the groin also there are a lot of uh, traction apophysitis around the hip like anterior superior iliac spine where the attachment of the sartorius anterior inferior iliac spine where the rectus femoris attached lesser trochanter where the iliac is attached all these conditions co cause uh, traction apophysitis 
and causing anterior, anterior hip pain. The other condition is a slip uh, capital femoral epiphysis where the, the slippage of the, it is usually commonly in a adolescent uh, fat, fat uh, uh, male, usually they, usually they present with limb and most of the time rather than the hip, they come out with the knee pain because of the, the nerve supply in the Hilton Road. So that is one of the questions I think we put forward. Uh, you, when, when, a, when a young athlete coming with the, uh, with the, with the, with the limb pain and the knee pain, you, the first thing is we must always exclude uh, the, the presence of uh, sleep, 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 capital femoral epiphysis, which definitely you have to uh, examine the patient's hip. And the lateral hip pain is one of the uh, is common condition is a great rotator pain syndrome, which is a, which is a combination of gluteus medius tendinopathy, which is a main uh, which, which is an abductor of the hip, and also the trochanteric bursitis and snapping hip. All these conditions together we call it a great rotator pain syndrome commonest condition for lateral hip pain and also the ner nerve compression of operator either to build nerve these are also some of the commonest condition of lateral hip pain posterior hip pains are commonly due to posterior liberal tears and referred pain from the lumbar spine <coughs> so uh, when we talk about the femoral acetabular impeachment the fai this is one of the condition which cause causing a hip pain it is a it is more it is due to the abnormal dynamic contact between uh, between the proximal femur and the subulum if you look at the femur there there, there are there is a normal sphericity of the humeral head and the acetabular rim has to be fixed if there's an over coverage of the acetabular uh, labrum or or the loss of sphericity of the uh, humeral head which can cause into a abnormal bio, 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 biomechanics which can cause into the uh, damage to the femoral uh, neck or acetabular rim or the uh, labrum or the cartilage so the classification uh divided into cam lesion pincer lesion and combined lesion if you look at the cam, cam lesion if you look at the cam, cam, cam lesion where you can see the the the, the humeral head lost is specificity and then the neck and the neck which impinged to the on the uh, on the acetabular uh, pincer lesions are or uh, pincer lesions are uh over coverage. This is a pincer lesion, which is an over coverage of the <coughs> of the acetabulum, which can co compromise the uh, <coughs> compromise the femur, uh, and lead lead to femoral acetabular impingement. And there is also a combination of both can also be happen. So usually there is an impingement type of pain and inflammation. The the sequence of uh, start with the labral injuries and then move into the chondral tears, and eventually the patient can go into an uh, at the end stage, they can go into an osteoarthritis of the hip. hip. So the investigations, uh, X-ray pelvis, AP lateral, and the special done views, and also CT scan to do that. And management is to avoid the impinging activities, uh, gradual return to play, and if if there are no no significant improvement with this, and and there is an ongoing uh, chondral and the labral lesion, the patient has to go for a surgery as uh, as an open or arthroscopy process, arthroscopy for the resection. Moving on to the groin pain, groin pain, the groin pain, this is the a, a, a Doha classification of a, a groin pain, which has mainly four subcategories related to the groin pain in athletes. It is the pain related to the iliopsoas related pain and adductor related groin, uh, groin pain and this inguinal related groin pain and pubic, pubic bone related groin pain. If you look at the iliopsoas, or iliopsoas tendon attached to the uh, lesser trochanter, so it's a pain with a resistant flexion, tendinopathies and tears can cause this condition, and also uh, hips stretching, uh, stretching of the hip flexors will increase the pain. The other common condition is an adductor related pain, where, where you can look at the adductor longus is attached to the pubic uh, symphysis pubis, 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 inferior pubic ramus. And uh, chronic adductor tendinopathy and adductor strain can predispose to uh, this condition. Uh, so this falls into the adductor related pain of in a groin condition. The other category is a pubic related condition where the pubic symphysis, the, uh, due to the excessive load in the pubic symphysis, uh, which can go into a bone sclerosis and, and cystic changes and uh, come out uh, with the pain. So, <coughs> 
the, the, the other category of the groin pain is an inguinal uh, canal, inguinal related uh, groin pain, where the, the structures that you can see the structures uh, of the inguinal canal and the posterior uh, and the and the posterior surface of the inguinal canal uh, go into a stress in the and then patients will have a tenderness over the inguinal canal and also there there's you will not find any palpable inguinal hernia so this is we call it a, a sports hernia uh, hernia or a gilmore's groin where where you there is no palpable hernia but pain with uh, resistant uh, abdo uh, abdominal muscles or one salva cuff or sneeze. So these are the common four conditions associated with the groin, groin pain, as well as <clears throat> how long we have time. Okay, we will quick quickly go through that. Sorry. So the posterior thigh pain is a common condition is in hamstring muscle injuries hamstrings hamstring muscle groups a uh, group is a is a condition where you have four muscles mainly semimembranous and medial side uh, biceps on the lateral side and then uh, semitendinous uh, on the medial side these are the main muscles which involve uh, and one of the commonest injury injuries are type 1 and type 2 injuries where you uh, the type 1 injuries affect the biceps femoris muscles this biceps femoris muscle commonly in in in, in, in sprinting sprinting the type 2 injuries are stretching type injuries where kicking which is involved in the semi membrane membrane yes risk factors are uh, poor past injury with poor strength fatigue small muscle length and uh, reduced flexibility all these can predispose to uh, hamstring injuries treatment of hamstring injuries uh, acute phase uh, is a uh, eye therapy platelet rich plasma and laser are promising results and after the acute phase, there's a conditioning phase with the stretching and the strengthening of the muscles. And, and then it is important to uh, strengthen the gluteus maximus and the neuro and also neuromuscular control. Knee injuries, if you look at the, now moving on to the knee injuries, if you look at the knee, anatomy of the knee, where we can see the anterior posterior crucial ligam ligaments and, uh, and uh, lateral meniscus, the medial meniscus with uh, lateral cultural ligament and the medial cultural ligaments. These are common structures we can get uh, injuries, acute injuries in the knee. So acute knee, knee pain, if you look common is the medial meniscus injuries, medial cultural ligament, ACL sprain, lateral meniscus, articular cartilage and posterior crucial ligament. These are the common injuries with patellar dislocation. There are some less common uh, injuries like patellar tendon rupture, quadricep tendon rupture, uh, lateral cultural ligament sprain, patellar femoral contusion, bursal hematomas, uh, fat pad, uh, acute fat pad con contusion, uh, and uh, bicep femoris tendon avulsions, all these can uh, also be part of an acute injury, but those are less common. But we shouldn't miss uh, tibial plateau fracture and especially the avulsion fracture of the tibial spine, especially in, in young athletes where the ACL injuries are associated with the avulsion of the tibial spine. So it is important to uh, remember that the acute hemarthrosis, uh, uh, there are a few conditions. Where the major ligament injuries like ACL and PCL, patellar dislocation, osteochondral fractures, peripheral tear of the meniscus, especially the medial meniscus, uh, acute fat uh, fat plate impingement, the hofas, and the bleeding diathesis. All these can produce all these conditions can uh, can have uh, acute hemarthrosis. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little about the anterior crucial ligament injury, which is one of the commonest injury in sports where the contact sports. Uh, ACL prevent the anterior translation of the tibia. So the most common injuries are due to the cutting maneuvers and single leg uh, landing. It's non-contact injury most of the time, causing acute hematrosis, hematrosis plus inability, instability and giving way. Uh, it's a restricted range of movements, right? With positive latch tests. There are special tests for latch and pivot, pivot st shift tests to, to identify the uh, anterior cruciate ligament injury. The diagnos diagnosis, uh, sigron fra fractures are ethnomonic for ACL injuries in, in, in acute setup. Where if you look at that, uh, it's a anterolateral capsule avulsion of the of the tibial uh, uh, plateau. Uh, uh, this is the uh, this is the sigron fracture. If you find this fracture, it's more pathognomonic for uh, ACL inj injury. But MRI is the investigation uh, gold standard. Gold standard. Where you can see the fiber discount. You can see the oh. 
you can see the fiber discontinuity also the bone edema of the lateral bone uh, the, of the lateral femoral condyle condy. so with these findings uh, the definitive for athlete is an arthroscopic acl reconstruction usually return to play is about nine months <clears throat> the chronic conditions of the knee uh, knee <coughs> i will just run through these chronic conditions where the anteriorly you can get patellar femoral pain patellar tendinopathies uh, synovial plica quadriceps tendinopathy fat pad stress fracture of the patella all these conditions can uh, come uh, predisposed to a, a chronic uh, <clears throat> anterior knee pain and the laterally as i discussed earlier iliotibial band which is attached to the lateral uh, attached to the head of the fibula uh, the if the tightness of the band especially with the downhill running uh, can cause into a uh, iliotibial uh, band friction syndrome with lateral knee pain lateral meniscus pathologies osteoarthritis bicep femoris tendinopathies uh, PLC injuries all can uh, cause lateral knee pain. Medial, uh, chronic medial knee pain, uh, patellar femoral uh, syndrome is uh, one of the commonest one and also with osteoarthritis and plica uh, and uh, as well as uh, ansernis, pes anser and bursitis which is uh, at the common uh, bursa around the common insertion of the medial biceps, uh, medial hamstrings. Posterior knee pain are commonly Baker cyst, uh, bicep femoral tendinopathy and popliteal tendinopathy. <coughs> So we'll move on to the, the leg pain. Leg pain, there are common pathologies causing leg pain in sports. There are four. There are four categories. One is the tibial stress fracture. Tibial stress fracture. The other condition is an inflammatory type condition of medial tibial stress syndrome. We call it MTSS. The other condition is a chronic compartment syndrome. And, and the fourth one is an popliteal artery entrapment. So these are the common four conditions which can cause the uh, tibials uh, of the uh, leg pain in sports. So stress fractures, uh, there are two types, mainly the medial tibial stress fracture and stress fracture of the anterior cortex, which is a, which is a more vulnerable for non-union. Uh, even some cases uh, the, it's recommended for uh, fixation. Fixation. Uh, medial tibial uh, stress syndrome is the pain along the posterior medial, medial tibia. It's a diffuse pain, inflammatory type due, due, due to the attachment of, of, of the muscle. Activity related pain, usually the pain with activities and uh, gradually uh, reduce with the activity and the pain recurs on the next day more. Stress fractures, uh, usually the pain start at the beginning and continues to increase and the patient will stop at one point. So the compartment syndromes are, the mainly there are, there, there are, there are four compartments in the leg. Uh, out of this anterior compartment, which is comprising the, uh, of the tibialis anterior and the lateral, lateral compartment as the peroneus longus and previous and the deep posterior compartment, which has as uh, soleus and the gastrocnemius muscle gastrocnemius so uh, these are the compartment which can uh, which can go into a compartment syndrome the, due to the excessive overuse overuse uh, the compartment pressure goes up and and the, and the structures within the compartment uh, get get compromised and uh, including the even including the nerves so therefore the pay, activity start about 10 to 15 minutes of running and gradually the patient uh, increase and it lasts up to a few minutes and, and then, then disappear and there won't be rest pain at all. So the compartment syndrome uh, is a diagnosis by compartment pressure testing. Uh, based on this, we can uh, manipulations and even uh, com some cases we have to go for a, a compartment release. release. <clears throat> so if the anterior compartment is involved, the, the, the deep uh, uh, Fibular nerve uh, can be uh, involved with the with the paresthesia over the dorsum of the foot, lateral compartment on the, on the lateral side, uh, and then the deep posterior compartment uh, have uh, so uh, sole paresthesia over the sole. <coughs> so popliteal artery entrapment is a pain in the calf, usually pain in the calf. The pain worse with exercise. There could be pulse diminish uh, diminish, but there is no rest pain, and immediately with with the exercise stop the pain disappears. So these the the choice is MRI because there are multiple, there are many causes, anatomical uh, structures causing uh, the entrapment. So MRI is a, a choice. Of this one. So if you look at that, this is the uh, stress fracture of the anterior cortex, cortex, which is more prone to get uh, non-union. And this is a, a stress fracture of the medial stress fracture, which is uh, just a good outcome of uh, for healing. And the investigation. For, and this is the condition of a uh, medial tibial stress syndrome where x-rays you will not find anything but if you look if you look at the mri you can look for the bone edema especially involving the peri periosteum or the bone marrow depending on the grading the management plan varies so this is what i, I discussed about the anterior and posterior uh, 
posterior and the lateral compa compartment. And moving on to actually stenopathy, uh, the commonest condition in the actually is a mid portion actually stenopathy, uh, where insertional type of the tendinopathy is uh, more kind of inflammatory type with the with the burst uh, burst or inflammation. But mid portion actually stenopathy is mostly uh, in athletes with the uh, with uh, over with uh, sprinters and marathon runners. Uh, Present with the usually present with the the pain start with the activity and uh, but they they will have more stiffness on the on the next day morning. So pain increase with the load and sprinting, football and cricket, uh, fast bowling are the common uh, sports with the at least uh, mid portion at least. Risk factors are usually high BMI, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia and especially the fluoroquinolone, the ciprofloxacin uh, kind of drugs. Even uh, if you take the drug for three two three days, also it, it uh, there is a Evidence that uh, it can go into a rupture of the rupture or, or severe uh, actually stenopathy. So it's important to prescribe uh, patients with uh, actually stenopathy uh, for fluoroquinolone. loan. And the past injury and the steroid injections also predispose, predispose uh, uh, especially the training load. The treatment of uh, actually stenopathy is mainly the, te the tendon energy storage exercises. And so th there are typical exercises to store and release of the energy in the tendon. As well as uh, platelet rich plasma, sclerosing agents, 10x procedures where the, you, you, uh, where the, the, the <clears throat> matrix can be, uh, can, 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 can be taken from the through a process in a intervention and all the shock wave. Then another condition where shock wave is promising results. Ankles, ankle sprain, a little bit of ankle sprain, one of the commonest sport injury uh, we encounter. So the sport uh, ankle sprains are there are two types. One is an inversion type uh, and uh, inversion type. Usually, inversion type injuries affect the lateral ligaments like anterior ATFL, anterior tail of fibula, uh, and the calcaneal fibula and the posterior tail of fibula ligaments. Inversion type injuries are medial uh, ligament damage where the deltoid ligament is, is mostly involved, but that injury is very rare. The commonest is the inversion type injury associating with the lateral uh, ligaments. Uh, there is also a compression force. If there is a compression force, posterior injuries should be considered. The injuries are graded from grade 1 to grade 3, which we discussed, uh, grade 3, where the grade 1 injuries, uh, when it comes to the lateral lateral ligament, grade 1 injury is just a sprain of an ATFL, whereas grade 2 is a uh, <coughs> complete tear of ATFL with the sprain of the CFL. Grade 3 injuries are uh, complete tear of ATFL and CFL injuries. So the management for grade one and two injuries are always non-surgical. Grade three, uh, grade three injuries, uh, both non-surgery and surgical manage management can be done with casting, taping modalities, rehabilitation, rehabilitation. Uh, it is important to know that uh, when there is an ankle sprain, whether the patient has to go for an athlete has to go for an X-ray. So the Ottawa uh, ankle role, where you look for the tenderness in. Uh, and uh, tenderness in uh, in particular areas where posterior margin of the medial malleolus and the lateral malleolus, uh, navicul navicular bone, and the base of the fifth metatarsal. There are tenderness with patient cannot do uh, three four steps. It is an indication for for an uh, X-ray in, in in the setups of an uh, ankle sprain. So this can, condition can also be associated with peroneal tendinopathy, sinus tarsal syndrome, and chronic ankle instability. Foot pain. Foot pain uh, is also one of the commonest injuries. It's a very area, so I have briefed the foot pain into uh, in, in the three categories uh, because of the timing. And uh, so the the rear foot pain, where which we commonly encounter plantar fasciitis and fat pad contusion, and we also in athletes calcaneal stress fracture and tarsal tunnel syndrome, where the entrapment of the uh, branches of the posterior nerve. Uh, mid foot pain, uh, uh, the commonest one is the navicular stress fracture, which we should not miss that patient uh, athletes. Coming uh, runners coming with then pain on the media mid foot on the mid foot pain, especially the medial aspect over the navicular, and there's a significant end spot tenderness over there. This stress fracture should not be missed and uh, aggressively managed with the immobilized cast immobilization, depending on the on the stage. And then there's a mid tarsal joint sprain. Uh, TBR is posterior tendinopathy is uh, especially in runners, and then plantar fascia strain with people with plantar fasciitis or even athletes. With uh, runners can uh, rupture the plantar fascia present with mid foot mid foot pain. Four foot pain, the common conditions are metatarsal stress fracture, metatarsal, especially in the uh, joint uh, fractures like a uh, March fracture and joint fractures in, in runners. Metatarsal is a synovitis of the MTP joints, and uh, there are sesamoid injuries like stress fracture of the sesamoids, uh, the pain under the uh, first MTP joint where there are two sesamoids. 
um, and then other condition is a hallux valgus and, and turf toe where injuries to the <coughs> injuries to the palm aspect of the mtp joint and, and, and which hyperextension inju injuries so these are the common condition uh, involving in the food so the risk factors so we will uh, just uh, talk a little bit about the plant fasciitis uh, plant fasciitis is a risk factor is there are four main risk factors one is a it's a various knee various knee spike athletes cavus food where the uh, high arch food excessive training load these are the four main uh, in athletes with the plant, plant fasciitis so the pain will be on the in inframedial aspect morning stiffness the, we call it a first step pain when you get up in the morning first the pain that is called first step pain and there's a tenderness along the medial uh, calcaneum uh, investigation is important rule out the arthritis and x-ray to exclude the uh, fracture of the calcaneal spurs and ultrasound to look for the thickness uh, and the tears so treatment is a uh, there's a wide spectrum of treatment with the silicon gel pad and avoid loading and uh, low dye tapings and there are stretching of the plant of acr dry needlings techniques uh, and there is a uh, strasburg night spring where i do keep the you keep the uh, uh, food in a in a in a in a, in a dose flux patient while falling to sleep. There are there are promising results with uh, shockwave therapy for uh, plant fasciitis, as well as increasing mus uh, and muscle strengthening. Surgery is the last option, which is rarely done, rarely done, except in some recurrent cases. <clears throat> I just quickly go through uh, uh, sport injuries in, in young athletes young athletes there are a few conditions which involve where metaphyseal fractures where it's a torus fractures or buckling fractures facial fractures are salt harris fractures which has about about six type where the fracture through the through the physis and then fracture involving in the metaphysis physis with the water were <coughs> this is a <coughs> person holland segment and then there, there's another fra uh, fracture involving the articular surface this is the third type and through and through fractures are four and compression types of uh, type five so these are the salt harris type of fractures uh, happens in uh, in young young athletes and the other condition is an apophyseal fractures where avulsion the examples are as i mentioned here ilia crust abdominal muscles anterior superior spine sartorius anterior inferior spine uh, rectus abdominis and greater tuberosity the gluteus medius lesser trochanter the attachment of the ilia psoas uh, adductors, so all these can uh, predispose to uh, conditions like uh, avulsion fractures as well as uh, patellar tendon in uh, at the tibial tuberosity. Uh, all these uh, conditions uh, go into avulsion fractures, which is specific for young young athletes. Moving on to the uh, regional wise uh, sporting young, young injuries in young athletes. Uh, if you come across uh, the shoulder injuries. In shoulder, stress fracture of the proximal uh, humeral physis. This is called a little league shoulder, where the proximal uh, humeral physis can uh, go into a sclerosis and, and, and separation or even, even narrowing due to repetitive load, load, uh, load. This is a, one of the injury we in, encounter. And other condition is a shoulder impeachment. And when you come to the elbow, the apophysitis of the medial epicondyle. Uh, due to the excessive vulgar stress, uh, this can this produce, this condition can predispose to uh, predispose to uh, even uh, even uh, rupture of the medial collateral ligam ligament and and other other elbow condition is an osteochondritis with desiccans, which is involving on the on, on the lateral side of the especially on the <clears throat> lateral side lateral side and the wrist. At risk, the risk uh, we discussed earlier about the distal radial epiphyseolysis, especially the gymnast wrist, and 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 the back and the back pain, scoliosis, spondylolysis, and spondylolysis we discussed, which are more common in in, in young athletes. The hip pain we uh, we discussed about the apophysitis and other conditions are Perthes disease, where it's also chondrosis affecting the hip hip, and and then the other condition which we discussed, slip uh, uh, capital femoral epiphysis, where the Slippage uh, of the upper capital femoral uh, femoral epiphysis, especially in a in a, in a, in, a, in a adolescent fat uh, male male a knee or scoots lattice disease uh, where the apophysitis of the attachment of the 
patellar tendon at the tibial tuberosity. Sinning Larsen is a apophysitis at the inferior pole of the uh, inferior po uh, lower pole of the uh, patella patella. And the other condition is osteochondritis desiccans and discoid meniscus can also be present uh, in, in adolescence. Food, the uh, Seavers disease, where is the traction apophysitis of the calcaneus of Achilles, and tarsal coalition, where the, there can be coalitions between the tarsal and tarsometatarsal uh, intertarsal uh, bones. Uh, these are the conditions uh, which can predispose to food pain. The cochlear disease uh, is a condition uh, which affecting the uh, two, yeah, young athletes. Uh, athletes. <coughs> uh, the other condition in the foot is an apophysitis of the fifth metatarsal, where the tender, where the attachment of the peroneus brevis, peroneus brevis, uh, due to recurrent uh, recurrent traction, can present with an apophysitis. And Freiberg disease is also chondrosis affecting the neck of the metatarsal uh, metatarsal heads heads these are conditions which involve in the food so i have just gone through the superficially uh, so it's time is not possible to continue this uh, this uh, so hope we can finish the lecture uh, and thank you for listening to me on the first part of the lecture Now uh, it is the uh, time for questions related to the first part of the session. Uh, but uh, please uh, don't log out from the se uh, session. You have to join continuously till the end of the second session to apply for the certificate. Sir, so there's a uh, one uh, few uh, one question at the moment. What are the differences between isometric, isometric and isotonic exercises? Is there a difference in uh, myocardial oxygen consumption in those two? Can I talk? Can I see the Can I see the questions or is the checkbox? Okay. So on the it's a good question. Isometric exercises, uh, as you know, that exercises are involving without uh, without the change in the uh, muscle the muscle uh, length, which has a uh, more uh, produce more tension, whereas isotonic exercises uh, involving in the in, in uh, involving uh, in, in changes in the in, in the length, length length. So the when it comes to the blood myocardial oxygen, that is the main difference between the isotonic and iso isometric exercises. So the isometric exercises are usually performed uh, at the when somebody is injured where he cannot move the joints or move the tissues. So therefore the at the earliest uh, phases of uh, of post operative or uh, injury or splinting or at, at the early phases of, of this isometric exercise are performed once the patient pain and improves and the movements range of movements improved isometric then they can move into uh, isotonic exercises which can be in the form of a uh, uh, closed chain or, 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 or open open chain uh, kin kinetics exercises myocardial oxygen consumption Myocardial oxygen consumption, consumption uh, the more myocardial consumption should be uh, in, in isotonic, isotonic exercises, but I'm not sure about the, exactly the, what is the difference between the, how much different between the oxygen consumption. But if you look at the uh, physiology of the isotonic and isometric exercises, the isotonic, isotonic exercises are involving the increase in total peripheral resistance, whereas uh, isometric exercises, uh, exercises, uh, uh, sorry, uh, isotonic exercises are involving in the uh, uh, reduced uh, in total peripheral resistance, whereas isometric exercises are in involving in uh, increased peripheral resistance. So the, the the blood pressure the blood pressure goes up in iso isometric exercises, 
whereas the blood pressure doesn't change much in the isotonic excitation. So based on that, there is some little difference with myocardial consumption, uh, con uh, consumptions in isometric and isotonic excitations. The next question is, sir, uh, please explain the management of Achilles tendinitis. Okay, can I? Can you hear me? Right. So, actually, tendinitis I've discussed in the part of the management. Uh, there are two types. Uh, as I said earlier, it's a mid-portional and the uh, intersectional uh, tendinitis. So, I, I, I'm not sure which actually tendinitis you wa you wanted to know. But in in sports setup, the common is a uh, mid-portional actually tendinitis, where the the management is involving in in few few stages. The most important management is a is a tendon energy storage and release release that is a concept of uh, actually tendinitis and especially most of the tendinopathies so where at, at the early stage you do isometric exercises isometric exercises for the, to release the pain for the pain free because uh, that is a one of the pain modality for actually tendinitis and then you move into a gradually move into a isotonic exercises isotonic exercises with gradual loading of the tendon and then the exercises to to release the in, in, in energy of the tendon this is the uh, concept of tendon loading and tendon release exercises there are a special protocol for that we won't be able to sort of discuss, describe in the in this as well as uh, doing this tendon energy storage and release exercises there are other other components of uh, at least tendon should be should be mentioned those are those are the uh, those are the, the abnormal uh, abnormal tissues in the in, in the tendon matrix matrix can be uh, uh, can be overcome by the by the process called 10x where you have you can do uh, it's a intra it's a process pro process where you absorb uh, the ma ma matrix and promote the promote the healing and other one is you apply the nitric oxide donor patches patches and also there are some sclerosing agents where you un under the guidance of ultrasound you detect the new new vessels because the the in 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 in, in tendinitis there will be a lot of a uh, lot of uh, new vascularization so those as well, new new vessels can be sclerosed under the guidance of sclerosing agents agents and then the promising is a shock wave shock wave shock wave so these are the main uh, part of the treatment of actually tendinitis the other the other part is in stretching and strengthening of the of the actually tendon Okay, the, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next short session will be started in few minutes and please send your questions further into the chat box. They will be answered at the end of the next, uh, next session. Uh, keep join with us without logout. Uh, now uh, it's the beginning of the second session. Uh, now this is over to you, sir. I'm able to move this. I want this to take it outside. <coughs> Can I start? Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll quickly finish the run through the second session. I know you all, everyone is tired, <laughs> right? Okay. Sudden cardiac death in athletes, which is one of the one of the topic everybody is, uh, should have some idea, uh, idea, idea in their in their career. So, so sudden cardiac death by definition is a cardiac death in athletes. <clears throat> So cardiac arrest during or within one hour of participation of in sports. So cardiac arrest during or within one hour of participation in sports. So if we look at the incidence of data, one in 65,000 to one in 2,000 athletes and spectators for about 0.5 to 1 in, 0.5 per 100,000, 100, it's a leading cause of death in exercising young athletes, obviously. The, the FIFA FIFA certain member association had done a survey in the last two, ten years, and they have come out that with that one professional football player every month for the last ten years are dying with sudden cardiac death. So the important is the screening process, such as uh, pre-competition medical assessment, and or when necessary through efficient 
and an effective uh, treatment emergency treatment this is the important uh, message from from here so so if you look at the courses of sudden cardiac athletes we divide into basically three categories under 16 uh, under 35 and over 35 so if you look at under under, under 16 uh, athletes it's mostly upper respiratory tract infections uh, induced by myocarditis and the commercial code is where it's a cardiac contusion we'll discuss this later where a uh, cardiac contusion in martial arts like sports and then congenital, congenital coronary artery anom anomalies so these are the common co common condition in uh, under 16 and under 35 is the commonest one is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which was one of the questions we put forward so <clears throat> the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is uh, one of the main condition and we have to know about that and uh, we, we will uh, discuss with detail and the other condition is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia ARVC, the, now they call it is a uh, arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy <clears throat> and then they are also congenital coronary artery abnormalities can be part of uh, under below 35 over 35 as we know that coronary artery disease with vf is a main uh, present rhythm for sudden cardiac arrest in, in athletes if you look at the distribution of the causes of sudden cardiac arrest in young competitive athletes based on this uh, american uh, survey about 36 percent are 36 percent are Uh, 36 percent of due to high hypertrophic cardiomyopathy which is the first and and the second and the second commonest is about uh, coronary artery and anomalies coronary artery anomalies and other conditions other conditions like uh intermediate uh high hypertrophy hypertrophy where, which, which is a desire whether it falls into the uh, hyper, uh physiological high, high, uh, hypertrophy or a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and then myocarditis Arrhythmogenic, uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, mitral valve prolapse, about 4%, tunnel LAD, coronary artery disease, aortic stenosis, uh, aortic rupture, iron channelopathies, like, like conditions like Brugada, long QT syndromes, which we will discuss a little later, and congenital, uh, other congenital dis disorders, disorders. These are the common uh, findings from, uh, the, this has done from large number of studies from, uh, from uh, US. <coughs> Now, if you look at the causes of sudden cardiac death, it's basically divided into structural, electrical, and, and acquired. So if you look at the structural cardiac anomalies, the commonest one is, as we discussed, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, co congenital coronary artery anomalies, Marfan syndrome, mitral valve prolapse, and aortic stenosis. These are the conditions which is associated with the structural defect. And if you look at the electrical abnormalities we know that uh, wolf parkinson white, sy white syndrome these are it's a it's a pre-excitation syndrome and then congenital long qt syndrome these are channelopathies long qt syndromes uh, brugada syndrome short qt catecholamine these are involving with the iron channels potassium and, and sodium channels channels which involved in the muscle fibers so abnormalities in the channels can go into a triggers uh, trigger the the uh, vf and uh, uh, go into a sudden cardiac Arrest. We will discuss a little bit about these conditions. And the third condition is an acquired, uh, acquired abnormalities, mostly like in, in infection like myocarditis, uh, trauma, uh, commercial codis, that is a trauma to the chest, and the toxins like narcotics and um, cocaine abuse, hyperkalemia, hypothermia. So these are the other conditions causing sudden cardiac. Uh, cardiac. So we will be mostly focusing on the structural and cardiac and electrical abnormalities uh, in this presentation. So, the signs of on-field uh, sudden cardiac arrest. It is important to note that if a non-contact collapse, if somebody's unresponsiveness, loss of conscious, or abnormal breathing or apnea, or myoclonic uh, type of seize activity on the ground, on the ground, any athlete who collapses on the field of play and he is unresponsive must be regarded as being in life-threatening cardiac arrest until proven otherwise. So this is the take-home message. <clears throat> so we know that the, the time to defibrillation is uh, within two minutes. Within two minutes, that is the single greatest factor affecting the survival of the sudden cardiac arrest. And it's a time from uh, arrest to the defibrillation. And it's an if immediate uh, external defibrillation, we have to proceed. And if there is no defibrillation immediately, 
CPR has to be done. It is a call, push, and, and a recharge. That is the concept here. So the now the, the new guidelines, uh, the sideline uh, defibrillator should be behind the fourth match official. That is a new guideline in US, and probably it's the FIFA has introduced the same guidelines where the to prevent the sudden cardiac arrest, uh, the the AED should be behind the fourth official. Now how how do we prevent this uh, sudden cardiac? It's a screening basically. So what, what are the screening? So what we do is a pre-participatory evaluation with the history examination and in and, and, and investigation. <clears throat> so if you history is very important, the history with the exertion related chest pain, discomfort, and uh, un unexplained syncope or near syncope, palpitations, uh, SOB, um, any any history of cardiac murmurs or excise tolerance. These are important things of the current, and the important part of the history is. There should be a family history of three three generations. That is because most of these conditions are we are autosomal dominance uh, and uh, or an inherited condition. So it is important to know a three generation history when it comes to an athlete when you take the history for cardiac screening. So sudden, uh, especially in the in the his in 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 if there is a sudden unexplained death before 50 years or disability from the heart disease of the close relatives or family history of cardiomyopathy or long QT syndromes. Lugarda syndrome, Marfan syndrome, these all should be recorded and proper evaluation has to be done. Examination mainly BMI and the weight. Uh, it is important to know the uh, physical stigmata of Marfan Marfan syndrome, where it has association with the cystic median necrosis of the aorta and leading to aortic dis uh, dissection, uh, aortic degradation. So the, that, that is important to know about the features and pulse. Uh, Radial femoral pulse, pulse, uh, visperian pulse, conditions like uh, Hocum. And then it's more to note the blood pressure and uh, ejection systolic click, click, heart murmurs, all should be recorded uh, in terms of uh, conditions related to sudden cardiac uh, death. <clears throat> so the investigation is, is, is the first line investigation that is part of the pre parchment evaluation we do. And if there isn't any evidence of any particular condition which causing, then we, are, we can go into certain line investigations like like uh, excise ECG echocardiogram, Holter, uh, CT angiogram, uh, or cardiac MRI. So all these available. So based on the thing and with the, with the discussion with the cardiologist, uh, we should be able to proceed with the second line in, in investigations to prevent sudden cardiac death. Now, this is, uh, it is important to know about the normal ECG finding in athletes. So the British Journal of Sports Medicine, now uh, uh, there was an international criteria 2017 has formed about a normal ECG finding in athletes because athletes have a, a different, uh, you know, cardiac, uh, cardiorespiratory uh, activity. So there are some, uh, some, some uh, findings which are considered as normal. So it is important to note those findings and, and they are, it is an increased voltage criteria for LBH. That is uh, the voltage criteria for LBH, incomplete right bundle branch block, and early repolarization of ST segment, ST elevation followed by T inversion in B1 to B4 in black athletes. Whereas ST elevation B1 to B4 in normal individual, we have to consider about the uh, Brugada syndrome. In black athletes, this is an, uh, a normal ECG finding. T inversion uh, from B1 to B3 uh, in uh, age below uh, 16 years, that is also a normal finding. Sinus bradycardia, sinus bradycardia more than 30. Uh, ectopic uh, atrial. Uh, or a junctional rhythm, first degree AV block and morbids type two AV block. And these are uh, basic things. You know, we know that uh, first degree and uh, morbids type two AV blocks. So these, all these findings are normal ECG findings. Whereas abnormal findings are, we know, T inversions, ST depressions, pathological Q waves, complete uh, left bundle branch block, QRS, long QRS, epsilon wave. Epsilon wave is a wave which uh, is a deflex upward deflection following a QRS complex. It's a, one of the findings in uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, we will discuss it later. And then uh, ventricular pre-excitations, uh, prolonged QT interval, that's the QT, we will discuss about that. And Brugada pattern, profound uh, bradycardia, as I said earlier, bradycardia below 30. And then uh, PR interval, uh, more than 400. Uh, and then morbids type to second degree, third degree AV block, more equal or more than uh, two premature ventricular complexes, atrial tachyarrhythmias, ventricular tachyarrhythmias, all these conditions 
are abnormal ECG findings. Now we know the normal findings and abnormal findings, and there are some borderline ECG findings where left axis deviation, left axis uh, left atrial enlargement, right axis deviation, uh, right axis and uh, atrial enlargement, and complete right one one block. So all these conditions you would look for if two or more of these condition patient has to go for further evaluation, like in abnormal findings, or if in isolation there are no further evaluations need, uh, needed in asymptomatic athletes with no family history of uh, or inherited cardiac uh, diseases. So this is the normal ECG findings and it's better to uh, have a clear idea about that uh, when you look at ECGs in athletes. So the common causes of sudden cardiac death, we'll discuss about a little bit of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, because, which is the leading cause of course, about 30 to 40 percentage. So it's an autosomal, autosomal dominant condition. Uh, usually they, they will associate with exertional dyspnea, angina, uh, it's important, exertional dyspnea, not at rest, angina, syncope, pre-syncope, fatigue and palpitations. Pulse, it's a bisphyrian pulse with rapid uh, upstroke and uh, downstroke, prominent uh, A wave in uh, JVP, reduced right ventricular compliances. And you can see double, uh, some some at least if a, with whole common double apex beat. And most importantly, the ejection systolic murmur is burst heard at the left sternal edge. And it is important to note that this, uh, the, this murmur intensity is increased by maneuvers to reduce the preload, like uh, like uh, standing from a scut or a valsalva. So all these, when you look at the murmur, uh, do the maneuvers and check whether the intensity or what has happened to the intensity. So that is one of the important finding uh, also MR murmurs. So if you look at the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy ECG findings, it is important to note that uh, dagger Q waves, like if you look at the Q waves here, Q waves here. These are deep uh, dagger Q waves, like deep, sharp dagger Q waves, uh, especially in the in uh, lateral uh, inferior le le leads. It's very clear uh, here. So this is called a dagger Q waves. And then giant precordial T inversions. Uh, you, you can see the precordial T inversions here. So the uh, giant uh, precordial T inversions. And there's a voltage criteria for LVH. Uh, if you look at here, the V5 to uh, V1, V5, there's a voltage criteria for LVH. And then left atrial hypertrophy, there's another feature. And there's also will be some signs of uh, WPW syndrome signs like short PR interval with, with uh, delta waves. So this about 33%. So all these findings will give some idea, but this cannot be a diagnostic. So, so the patient, if these findings have to go for a, a second line investigations like uh, echo and cardiac MRI, uh, cardiac MRI is a gold standard for diagnosis where we look for, uh, but but generally we do a uh, 2D echo. Ideally, the trans uh, esophageal echo is, uh, is it's more sensitive than the uh, TTE. Uh, so the echo, the echo and the cardiac MRI findings, if there's a left ventricular hypertrophy wall thickness equal or more than 30 millimeter in females or equal or more than 15 millimeter in males, it is diagnostic of uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's an asymmetrical enlargement, and there is this, uh, also systolic anterior uh, motion of the mitral valve is another feature which you can find in uh, in 2D echo. Uh, left ventricular uh, outflow tract obstructions with the peak pressure more than 30. These are the findings in echo, and increased left atrial size of more than 48 millimeter or in, in, in a dimension or 108 milliliter in, in a chamber volume. So these are the sort of common uh, findings uh, which we can go, uh, go in the circline investigation. So the management wise, it's a beta blockers, modify the lifestyle. Yeah. Surgery is very rarely in a limited circumstances. Uh, ensure the family members to check and assess the sudden cardiac death, um, whether, whether, whether it's a low risk or a high risk. I'm not going to discuss into the uh, sports participation criteria because there are there are guidelines for European Society of Cardiology and, 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 and Bethesda guidelines, which says that uh, class 1A sports like low intensity, low dynamic sports can, can be performed with, with this, uh, with HOCOM, but there are some restrictions for other, other, other sports, uh, a different one, uh, which, which will consume a lot of time. So we, I'm not much going into the uh, uh, ESC or Bethesda guidelines for sports participation with these conditions. If anyone interested, please. Uh, we will definitely help. <clears throat> the other condition, the second most common is the uh, coronary artery anomalies, where the two third, usually two thirds are not symptomatic. One third of the patients may have some exertional syncope. 
examination usually normal because it's an anomaly of the coron anomalous coronary artery the definite diagnosis by ct angiogram or cmr is a gold standard where you can see that uh, this is a normal uh, right coronary artery in the left coronary artery with the pulmonary artery whereas uh, the anomalous arteries you can see that right coronary artery uh, left coronary origin from the from, from the right uh, and the right coronary from the left so these are these because of this they, they can go into a sandwiching effects between the pulmonary and the aortic trunk so these sandwiching effects are the what causing ischemia and uh, and uh, ischemia and sudden cardiac uh, conditions uh, conditions so the risk stratification is based on the direction of the myocardial induced ischemia so that is the main uh, factor we decide on that so we, anyway it's an absolute contraindication for for competitive sports if the patient is because it's the second most common cardiac death with uh, uh, exertional induced myocardial ischemia the other condition arrhythmogenic uh, cardiomyopathy the formally we call it ar which is that arrhythmogenic right ventricular hyperventricular uh, cardiomyopathy uh, now it's more than the right ventricle even it's, it's there in the left ventricle so the term is uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy so it's autosomal dominant condition where the replacement of the right ventricular tissue by a fatty fibrous tissue that is the main pathology here so the ecg if you look at the ecg t inversions you can look see for t inversions and prolonged qrs complex in v1 to v3 prolonged qrs complex in v1 to v3 and then uh, epsilon wave uh, epsilon i discussed earlier epsilon wave is a, uh, following a qrs complex there is an upward deflection this is called epsilon wave this epsilon wave uh, can be found about more than 30 to 40 percent of people uh, especially on the anterior precordial uh, precordial leads leads um, it's not always but the some proportions if you find the excellent law it's a it is more significant of an uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and there's an s-wave uh, uh, s-wave uh, approach i've spoke about v1 to v3 or more than uh, 45 55 milli millisecond with incomplete right bundle branch block and also vt with the uh, left bundle branch morphology so these are the findings which can come across in the ecg ecg cardiac uh, mri is the imaging uh, it demonstrate the right particular dilatation in aneurysms uh, aneurysms so we'll move on to the electrical problems now channelopathies channelopathies uh, as i discussed earlier the sodium and potassium channels have abnormalities and genetic uh, malformations transformation in the sodium and potassium channels can alter the the alter the physiological uh, neuromuscular transmission and thereby the the impulse the uh, the cardiac rhythm can be changed so this will produce uh, go into a conditions like uh, vt and vf uh, and and sudden cardiac death so there are different gene codes for different pumps and mutations uh, cause different conditions so the, the common four conditions are long qt syndrome rugada syndrome short qt syndrome and cataclo Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, so CPVT. So these are the common four conditions. So out of this, I thought of discussing about long QT and Brugada here. So the Brugada syndrome uh, is a is a syndrome. It's a it's a channel. It's a channelopathy uh, involving the sodium uh, potassium channels. It has it's a type one and type two Brugada ECG patterns there. But if you look at that, uh, there is the type one pattern where you will see the elevated ST segment segment with more than two millimeter ST elevation and uh, upward convexity which is a cope the pattern and then followed by followed by T inversion that is the main important things uh, especially in the V1 uh, and V2 so if you look at if you look at the V1 to V3 there is a cope type ST elevation followed by T inversion that's the most important thing so V1 V2 V2 V3 there's an ST elevation could be either coved up in type one or a saddleback type in type two, followed by followed by a T inversion. It's a prominent feature. Whereas you will also find some partial uh, right bundle branch uh, block block fe uh, features features. Having a uh, uh, type one uh, Brugada syndrome with with certain features is a di di diagnostic. The type two Brugada pattern is not diagnostic of Brugada syndrome. So type it has to be type uh, type, or or else if the if the type two pattern is converted to a type one following in a class one a uh, drug induction. 
so it is important not the no not about the type 1 brugada pattern so when you come to brugada the treatment is uh, treatment is uh, like uh, like all other conditions uh, most of the channel pathies uh, treatment is in beta blockers beta uh, uh, blockers and uh, it's a cardiac hypophysiologist uh, intervention in conditions where the icd uh, may be necessary so the other conditions we are talking about this uh, pre excitation syndromes the commonest type is in uh, wolf parkinson white syndrome uh, where it's it, which is an increased risk for sudden cardiac death because there are multiple pathways atrioventricular pathways uh, causing this uh, excited uh, causing pre excitation so if you look at the ecg pattern uh, there are p waves may be buried in the qrs complex or retrograde uh, short pr uh, pr interval if you look at the pr interval is short as well as the qrs complex is uh, usually um, wide uh, more than 10 meter with slur the onset of the qrs complex is is slurred that is what we call it a, a, a delta wave the delta wave is a is a slurred component of the, the qrs com beginning of the qrs complex with short short uh, pr interval and there are two types uh, ty uh, brugada uh, wpw type a type e depend on the left and right pathways pathways so if you look at this uh, we have to go into a uh, going because this is associated with avnrt and avrt which can produce post into a, a vt and vf uh, during strenuous exercises so therefore uh, induction uh, with class 1a drugs and for the evaluation is is indicated uh, the long qt syndrome is another channel of is involving in potassium channel mostly and sodium channel which has our long qt 1 2 3 there are different types types if you look at the long qt syndrome uh, the qt interval the qt interval is the consideration here usually the qt interval the the upper limits are 470 millisecond for for males and 484 females that is the upper, upper limit but with athletes athletes it's a common consensus that uh, any qtc corrected qtc more than 500 millisecond is diagnostic this is one of the question i think we put forward uh, for you all to answer prior to the session so this is the take home message that if you find a QTC corrected more than 500, it should be alarmed. Alarm. So what, is, what are the important things uh, here is that there are some condition which predispose Q, uh, QT interval and go into a into a uh, and, and, and predispose to VF. Uh, so there are some. So it is important to avoid, especially the QT prolongation drugs like like uh, macrolides, erythromycin, uh, TCA, tricyclic in in uh, so. This kind of drugs has to be avoided because these drugs uh, produce uh, uh, tosadi points and, and VF uh, in patients with Q, Q, QT high prolonged QT interval. There are two types. One is a uh, long QT one, which is uh, associated with cold and swimming. So athletes are going to swimming and they suddenly they go into uh, go into a, a VF and sort of cardiac arrest. And other condition is the long QT two, where it's uh, emotional people with emotional anxiety. Uh, at this status and then they can go into sort of uh, conditions of cardiac arrest uh, i have uh, i haven't discussed about the so short qt and uh, C, uh, cpvt uh, which is also a uh, channel of these and then i'm moving on to the condition of uh, commercial codis which i told earlier it's one of the course for in in in, in younger young athletes uh, below 16. Uh, it is a it, commercial codis is a traumatic sudden course of death where arrhythmia usually vf so it's 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 believed that the blunt force of the trauma to the chest occurred during the vulnerable period of uh repolarization that is usually the t wave uh and can be a qrx also so if you look at that here so if you look at the pictures here now this is martial art martial art unfortunately i could play the video clip it's a martial art where the athlete uh get a shot to the chest and within minutes he collapses so the, the 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 time if you look at the time the the, the during the qt interval so in the qt interval repolarization this is the particular vulnerable commercial code is risk window so if you get a blow at this particular point and if you are vulnerable there's a chance to get if you look at here from the normal rhythm go into a vf and then pain going going go to arrest so it is important that is why i don't know whether any of any of you all remember this is Italian uh, France match where Zinedine Zidane was uh, given a red card just prior to the final uh, penalties by hitting the chest and then and, and the reason was explained why because of uh, commercial codes so it's funny there is a there is a point behind that 
anyway so commercial code is a condition where uh, caused by a blunt force most commonly in adolescent players and also in martial art so th there are some evidence that chess protectors and uh, soft co basketball uh, decrease this but do not eliminate the risk so it is important to note about note about that uh, thank you very much uh, i think uh, we will uh, if anyone interested uh, about the european society of cardiology guidelines for conditions leading to sudden cardiac death feel free to contact us and we should be able to give some uh, feedbacks because of the time frame and the long session we won't be able to sort of discuss about this uh, guidelines uh, for sports participation hope we'll do it another day thank you so much uh, there are a few questions sir uh, first one is uh, how can we differentiate peripheral vascular disease from cr uh, chronic exertional compartment syndrome in leg by history so it is uh, that uh, peripheral vascular disease uh, and chronic uh, compartment syndrome it's an, uh, chronic compartment syndrome is an activity related the the question is a uh, chronic compartment syndrome or a, or a chronic exertional compartment syndrome right so chronic exertional compartment syndrome is a pain it's a pain where you you don't get pain at rest the pain start about five to ten minutes into exercise due to the compartment pressure pick up and then once you stop the pain will last for about a few few minutes few minutes and then gradually be off and you won't get a rest pain depending on the compartment involved depending on the cardiac compartment involved you will have a uh, sense of symptoms in different area for example i said there are three mainly three compartment anterior compartment lateral compartment and the deep posterior compartment so the anterior compartment where uh, tibialis anterior muscles as well as the deep uh, uh, deep uh, fibular nerve uh, uh, deep part of the common peripheral nerve right so deep fibular nerve so which is uh, the, the, the sensation will be more onto the first web space web space where else if the involvement of the uh, lateral compartment uh, lateral compartment lateral chronic compartment syndrome that is that the, the, the structures are peroneus longus peroneus brevis and superficial peroneal nerve which applies to the dorsum and the lateral aspect of the of the foot so whereas if there is a deep posterior compartment the, the sensor will be on the on the sole so you will have a definitive uh, sensory pattern and also the particular the history which which definitely differ from the uh, peripheral vascular disease uh, i hope uh, you understand uh, you take the message uh, the next question uh, is regarding hamstring strain ma uh, strain management sir uh, during acute phase can the prp and laser be given yeah there are some uh, new bmj uh, british general uh, general sports medicine uh, suggests that uh, laser uh, is effective in fact we we do lasers and we have promising results uh, with laser in, in acute uh, tears uh, especially in hamstrings and other muscles so we which expedite that uh, prp there are promising results now coming up that you know giving a, a prp during the uh, early phase acute phase early phase acute phase lasts for a period of long time uh, we, uh, because we uh, the tre treatment phases you know we we divide into uh, different different categories like you know acute phase where we are re uh, mo modeling and we give eyes and we give modalities and then uh, we start stretching early so during this phase you know giving prp also uh, there are evidence to uh, improve uh, expedite the the healing and then the rehab process, process. Uh, the next sir uh, what are the physiological changes in cardiovascular system in athletes physiological changes in cardiovascular athletes uh, is a physiology question anyway there are changes can be acute and chronic the physiological changes can i can him it's a it can be acute and chronic so the, the importantly the, the chronic changes are your heart rate goes down first so that is the main one of the main factor where your your cardiovascular fitness if your resting heart rate is low the more the low you are you are fitter the by cardiorespiratory so your resting heart rate goes down your blood pressure goes down uh, blood dis uh, uh, distribution important capillaries op open up open up so open up 
So these are the sort of physiological changes, uh, changes, uh, chronic changes, acute changes of exercise. Your blood pressure a little bit increased, stroke volume increased, uh, and then the the pulse pressure increased. So so the, these are the sort of uh, changes in cardiovascular uh, due to exercises. The last question, sir. Uh, can you little more explain how to manage the shoulder pain and knee pain in older people with no injuries? Uh, the question is very vague because uh, when you say shoulder pain and knee pain, uh, because uh, I think I, I, I put forward that uh, when you say knee pain, uh, it's an acute pain and chronic pain. When you come to chronic pain, you have medial, lateral, anterior. So there are so every region has every a different pathology so based on the so if it's an anterior knee pain or a medial knee pain so if you then you have to uh, you have to understand that uh, what is what structure is uh, is pathology here and uh, and based on that you have to start your treatment so i i discuss uh, most of the treatment and i give an overview that about uh, particular particular conditions so based on that you have to come to a sort of a tentative diagnosis and then if it's a tendinopathy what's the management or if it is a patellofemoral or or if it is involving in the tendon or involving in the internal derangement, so depend on that the knee has to be changed. The similar setup, if you say shoulder pain, uh, shoulder pain can be many reasons. Uh, chronic shoulder pain can be about about ten to eleven uh, be put forward and we will discuss. So uh, it has to be specific uh, for us to discuss about a particular condition. So it is the end of the web, uh, today's webinar. Uh, our sincere thanks to Dr. Faris Ahmed, the senior registrar in uh, sport and um, exercise medicine, uh, for his excellent lecture uh, on an overview of sport injuries and sudden cardiac death in athletes. So thank you uh, for spending your precious time with us, sir. Uh, so please find the link for the e-certificate in, uh, in the chat box. And please kindly give your feedback, answer the post assessment questions also, and receive your e certificate for participation. Thank you very much.